comfy Christmas jammies and I hope you got some coffee and you're enjoying this worship service. We're glad that you're here this morning. Make sure that you shout out where you're from, where you're watching from, and remember later on in the worship service to get ready to think about those prayers and go ahead and put those on the screen as well. So we're going to start now with a prayer. So will you join me in the opening prayer? Gracious God, help us to leave our darkness at the door. This is a season of light. It is a time of celebrating. We pray that we will honor you with our words and songs today. Lord, bring in the season of light. Amen. All right, so it's time for a Christmas hymn, and the title of this one is O Come Emmanuel, because that's what I'm preaching on, Emmanuel, God with us. So um, I hope you enjoy this song. Make sure you sing loud. Creator God, in the beginning you called light from darkness, and you have made your light to shine in all of our hearts by displaying your glory in the person of Jesus Christ. We call him by many names, but they all point to your presence, power, and love. 
May we shine with your light not only at Christmas, but at all times. In all our words and deeds, as Jesus took on human flesh a long, so long ago, may we, your followers, incarnate your love for others so that all might give glory to our Father in heaven. Amen. All right, thank you, Gail and kids. You did a great job. So this is the fourth Sunday in Advent, and we really, um, really appreciate you uh, lighting the Advent candle for us. So, kiddos, it is time for a children's message. So I have a Christmas tree here, and as you'll see, we have another Christmas tree over here. So what I want to talk about is what is the very first thing that you see when you look at a Christmas tree? What's the first thing that you notice on a Christmas tree. Let's go over here. What's the first thing do you see? Is it the lights? That'd be pretty good because they're pretty bright, aren't they? Is it um, the ornaments? Ooh, those are pretty, aren't they? Yes, all strategically placed. Thank you, Anne. And <laughs> maybe it's some of the other decor, the pearls. Is it the angel on top? I don't know if you can see the angel, but a beautiful angel up there. I mean, what do you think is the most significant part of this tree? What is it that really makes a Christmas tree a Christmas tree? Well, here's one here, and so I'm going to stand this Christmas tree up and see what makes a Christmas tree. Oops. Okay, let me try that again. So what's the most important thing about a Christmas tree? The base of the Christmas tree. That is the most important thing of a Christmas tree is the bottom or the base. So I'm going to go ahead and put this one on and let's just see how it works. Oh, we got all the time in the world. You guys are at home drinking your coffee, so nobody's rushing you anywhere, right? So let me put on my Christmas tree base, the base of the Christmas tree. What makes a Christmas tree? What's the most significant and important part of the Christmas tree? It is the base. Let's see if it works. Ta-da, and, oops, hold on, and, ta-da. So I want you to know that the most important part of the Christmas tree, you know, the lights are beautiful, the bulbs are gorgeous, the angel is wonderful, or the star on top is wonderful, but the most significant part of the Christmas tree is a base because without the base, the Christmas tree isn't gonna stand up, so it needs a base. So I want you to remember for this Christmas, the most important thing for Christmas is not so much Christmas trees and presents, it's the baby in the manger, it's Jesus Christ. Sometimes when we go in and look at a Christmas tree, we never sit there and go, oh, let me look at that base, isn't that a nice looking base? Nobody does that, right? And so Christmas sometimes gets away from the true meaning of the season, the real reason for Christmas, and it's that Jesus came, God came in the flesh, so that he would know what it's like to feel pain and he'd know what it's like to feel lonely. So I want you to know that just like this Christmas tree, nobody really notices the base, but that's the most important part of the Christmas tree because without it, it tips over. The most important part of Christmas is Jesus Christ. So I want you to remember that. So um, as you get closer to Christmas and get excited about Santa coming and all of those wonderful things, I want you to remember that the real reason for Christmas and the most significant part of Christmas is Jesus Christ coming into the world. So let's say a prayer and thank Jesus for coming into the world. Okay, let's pray, kids. Jesus, we do thank you that you are our Emmanuel, God who is with us, who came from heaven to show us what God is like. And so we thank you, Lord, that Christmas is not all about presents and Santa, even though that's wonderful things and even Christmas trees. What's so significant about Christmas is your son, Jesus. So let us always remember what Christmas is about. It is about the living God who came to be one of us. What a miracle. Thank you so much, Jesus. Amen. All right, so I'm going to leave this kind of ugly looking tree right here for now, but I will take it away and uh, later on. So we're going to go ahead and read from the Gospel of Matthew again, okay? We're still in the Gospel of Matthew. And the scripture reading comes from Matthew 1, verses 22 through 23. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we are living in uncertain times, aren't we? Sometimes it's a little scary what's going on right about now. Sometimes we don't know if we're going to have a job tomorrow or if we're going to get sick. And so we really want to pray for God's protection. So I want to show you a video of a guy who's going to pray for a hedge of protection. So I'm going to go ahead and show that. So look how to pray for a hedge of protection. I think the way we pray is, you know, prayer, is a, prayer is a powerful thing, but I think it's when you grow up in church that you should hear prayers all the time in different styles and stuff. You know, little quirks that people have when they pray. I don't know. Little phrases that I don't understand to this day. But we use the phrases, but we, that's just what we heard growing up. We think that's just the right thing to say when we pray. You know, like hedge of protection. You ever hear that? You hear that a lot. Hedge of protection. Then we are praying a hedge of protection around you, buddy. That's right, a hedge. <laughs> around you and your whole family. <laughs> a hedge, huh? I don't mean to complain. Is that the best you can do? <laughs> How about a thick cement wall? <laughs> With some razor wire on top of that bad boy. A good set of clippers get right through that thing. I'm sure the devil's got a set of those. I mean, you think a hedge is going to scare the devil away? What is this greenery? <laughs> I can't get through that. Move that bush. My greatest weakness is landscaping. How do they know? That's how the devil walks like this. Well, he has a pointy tail. He doesn't want to step on his tail. And he talks like a game show host. Fantastic. You get the turtle legs. <laughs> Forget the last 30 seconds ever happened in your life. I know. <laughs> so, funny, right? Funny how we pray a hedge of protection. Um, and that was pretty, pretty funny. But really, most of our prayers, most of our prayers are filled, if we're serious, are filled with asking God to protect us, to protect our kids when they're at school, to protect um, our jobs, that we have one when we go back to work on Monday morning. So if, we're really, if we really think about it, we're really honest, a lot of times we ask God for protection. And what the wonderful thing is, is that God does protect us. He protects us all day long, and sometimes we don't take a look at it. Sometimes we don't even notice it. But the Bible is filled with verse after verse after verse about God's protection. Matthew tells us that Jesus is called Emmanuel, God with us. And Emmanuel means that God became human and he came in the flesh and he delivered us from sin and death. But Emmanuel also means that God does something. God doesn't just show up and he goes, God is with us. Isn't that great? God actually protects us. He actually protects us. He actually does something. So Emmanuel means more than God saving us from sin and death, although that would have been enough. But Emmanuel, Emmanuel actually means that God also protects us. At least that's what it meant to the Old Testament believers is where Matthew is quoting from anyway. Matthew is quoting from Isaiah. And so Emmanuel to the Old Testament Jewish people meant that God was not only with them, with them, he was also protecting them. Matthew is the only gospel writer that picks up on calling Jesus Emmanuel. And so he looks at his time and his history and he what was going on in his world. And Emmanuel was more than Jesus coming to earth and becoming one of us and dying for us and delivering us from sin and death. It also meant that he's protecting us. So what does Emmanuel mean to us today? That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what Emmanuel meant to Judah because that is who um, the prophet Isaiah is speaking to or the people, God's people in Judah. We're going to talk about what Emmanuel meant to Matthew and the disciples during Jesus' time and what Emmanuel means to us today because I think it's a word where we say, boy, it sounds good. God is with us. It sounds wonderful. But what does it mean practically? So let's start on a side note, by the way. You'll see Emmanuel spelled two different ways. Emmanuel with an I and Emmanuel with an E. Well, it's simple. 
The I spelling of Emmanuel is the Hebrew spelling for the word Emmanuel, and the E is the Greek spelling for the name Emmanuel. So in the Old Testament, you'll see Emmanuel spelled with an I, and in the New Testament, which was written in Greek, you'll see it spelled with an E. So Bible trivia for you, <clears throat> but let's talk about what Emmanuel, the name Emmanuel, God with us, meant to the people of Judah, to God's people in the Old Testament. Now to do that, we got to Dial back about 735 years before Jesus' birth. Now here's a little bit of history, okay? Stay with me. Israel, um, God's people, that was broken up into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, okay? So the northern kingdom in the Old Testament is called Israel. It can also be called Ephraim because that was the territory, and it can also be called Samaria to be even more confusing because Samaria was the capital of Ephraim. So. The names for the northern kingdom in the Old Testament are Israel, Ephraim, and Samaria. Now, there's a southern kingdom called Judah, which is one of the tribes of the 12 tribes of Israel. By the way, the northern kingdom was made up of nine of these tribes from the 12 tribes of Israel. And the southern kingdom was made up of three tribes, Judah, Benjamin, and Simeon. And the capital of the kingdom of Judah was, you guessed it, Jerusalem. So why is this important? Because this is where Isaiah talks about, here's a sign, Emmanuel, the young woman will give birth. And I'll read that scripture in a minute. This is where Matthew picks that up. So it's very important to look at the history of it. So what was going on? Well, the northern kingdom and this, um, Israel, the northern kingdom, made an alliance with the kingdom of Aram. So the king, king of Israel and the king of Aram decide they want an alliance together because they want to go and defeat the Assyrian Empire. That was the big powerhouse at the time in the Old Testament during the prophet Isaiah's time. So what they want to do is they want to go and get the southern kingdom to join this alliance because then they'll be stronger. So they go, the king of Israel and the king of Aram, and they head on down to Judah and they talk to the King Ahaz, that's his name, and they say, hey, join our alliance because we want to take over the Assyrian Empire, we want to kick them out, we want to get, you know, our own power. Well, King Ahaz says, no way, I'm not joining your alliance. So what happens after that? Well, you guessed it, the King of Israel and the King of Aram, they decide they're going to kill King Ahaz because, hey, let's kill that king, we'll put our own king in there, he'll join the alliance and then we'll defeat the Assyrian army. So King Ahaz is a little bit afraid, okay? That's gonna, Emmanuel's gonna speak to the fear that um, during Matthew's time, during Joseph's time, and the fear that we have today in the world. So back then, King Ahaz was very, very afraid. He's got the northern kingdom coming after him and another kingdom coming after him. So pretty much, he has something to be afraid of. They're out to kill him. Here enters the prophet Isaiah. He gets into King Ahaz's chambers, and he says, God is going to protect you. He says, if you remain faithful. And he says, so ask God for a sign how he's going to protect you. And King Ahaz says, no, I'm not going to ask God for a sign. And Isaiah's like, ask God for a sign. And King Ahaz says, no, I'm not going to ask God for a sign. So here's the response from God speaking through the prophet Isaiah. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign anyway, King Ahaz. <laughs> this is where this comes in. And it says, look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son and shall call him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose good, the land before whose two kings you are afraid of will be destroyed. So Emmanuel to God's people during Isaiah's time was a actual young woman. Now, theologians believe it might have been Isaiah's young wife who was going to give birth to a son and she was going to name him Emmanuel. Other theologians believe it was someone in the royal court of King Ahaz, a young woman who would give birth and name that child, that son, Emmanuel. Either way, this child was going to be a visible sign that God was going to be with King Ahaz and that the fear of these two kings, he had nothing to fear about. God was going to take care of him. So God essentially tells Ahaz that before the child's old enough to know right from wrong and they think maybe five or six years old, other theologians believe the child was going to be in a, you know, kind of the 12, 13 year old, almost a man. Be, that way he would know the difference between good and bad and be able to choose good and bad. Before that happens, 
these two kingdoms are going to be destroyed. Isn't that what Isaiah said? Isn't that the prophecy that was going on? This is important. Stay with me. So what happens? In 722 BC, the Assyrian army invades the northern kingdom and takes her people into exile. In 720 BC, the Assyrian army goes into Aram, the kingdom of Aram, and takes his people as exiles. So King Ahaz was protected by God. That is what Emmanuel means. Emmanuel doesn't just mean God is with us. That sounds so good. To King Ahaz, he was afraid for his life and for his children's life because you think about it, he's got this royal household. They are all going to become slaves or they're going to be killed either way. The king of Israel was after him. The king of Aram was after him. And he has the Assyrian army in his back of his mind that could kill him at any time. So he was afraid. So when God gives him a sign, which he didn't ask for, he says, I'll give you one anyway, it means something. Emmanuel means not just that God is with us, which is a wonderful thing. It also means that God will protect us. That's what it meant in the Old Testament time to King Ahaz. He had a real fear. And this was a real woman who gave birth to a real human son and named him Emmanuel. And it was a sign that God would not only be with him, but God would do something that God is supposed to do. And that was to protect him. So now fast forward 720 years to Jesus' birth. Matthew tells his readers that the birth of Jesus to a virgin would happen to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet Isaiah. The virgin, notice he changes young woman to virgin, will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Matthew is the only gospel writer that calls Jesus Emmanuel. The only one. Look through the rest of the gospels. You can't find the name Emmanuel except for in the gospel of Matthew. Why? Matthew and all the disciples and all the Jewish people at that time, in Matthew's time and Jesus' time, would have been very familiar with the scroll of Isaiah. Even Jesus read the scroll of Isaiah in the synagogues, right? It was read every single week in the synagogue, probably every single day. This was a very important scroll, so they would have been very familiar with the prophecies from Isaiah. So they would have been familiar with the prophecies from Isaiah, because it was read all the time. Even Jesus read from the scroll of Isaiah himself. So... This is called, what Matthew looks at, is called a pattern of prophecy. I don't know if you've heard that before. Um, Adam Hamilton writes a little bit about it in his book. A pattern of prophecy is when a prophecy happens, you look at it during the time when the prophecy was given, during your own time and your own history and what was going on in the world at that time, which we just looked at. Isaiah gave the prophecy to King Ahaz. Now Matthew is using the same Emmanuel, a virgin will give birth, to Emmanuel. Jesus is known as Emmanuel. So a pattern of prophecy means that every generation, especially the Jewish people, would have read Isaiah's words in the light of their own time, in the light of what was going on in their world and in their history. So Matthew heard in Isaiah's prophecy of Emmanuel, Jesus, the deliverer of God's people. Not from the Assyrian army, not from the Aram army, the army of um, Aram and Israel, no, he was going to be the deliverer of sin and death. Matthew picks up on that and you think, okay, what's the big deal about that? We know that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. He did deliver us from sin and death. He came in the flesh, God with us. Well, what else did God do? If God in Ahaz's time protected him, he was God with him. That was a sign that a woman would give birth and call him Emmanuel. Matthew picks up. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh, right? God with us in the flesh. He's not just here, he's protecting us. How did he protect the disciples? How did he protect God's people? How did Jesus do that? Well, I'll tell you, he healed them of illness and disease, right? Everything we read in the gospel is God doing something. Jesus is doing something. He's not just with them walking around saying, hey, buddy, oh, I hate to, you know, those boils must be terrible. Oh, my gosh, that bleeding for 20 years must be terrible. I don't know how you live with yourself. Oh, you leper, you're disgusting. How do you even wash? I mean, it's like skin just come peel. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, which means he not only is with us, walking with us, understanding what it's like to be human, which is a huge thing in itself, and defeating death and sin, which is a huge thing in itself, but he's also protecting us. He's healing. He's, he's doing miracles. 
He protects the disciples from selfishness and greed. They were, most of them were fishermen, right? And they had profitable businesses. Well, they all left to follow him. But remember when he rose again? They went back to doing what? Fishing, which means their jobs were still there. He protected their jobs. He protected their family. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, would heal the sick, forgive sinners, miraculously feed 5,000, raise people from the dead. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, would control nature, calm storms, walk on water, and cast out evil. He didn't just say, boy, Mary, that's got to be hard having seven demons in you. Boy, how do you even know what's going on? Who are you even talking to in your head? No, he casts out the demons. He does something. So Emmanuel is more than God with us walking and talking. It's God doing something. So what does that mean for me and you today? What does that mean for us today? If this pattern of prophecy went through Isaiah, went through Matthew when Jesus was born, should go to us today. God, Emmanuel, is with us in and through the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Those who believe in Jesus, God is with us. He lives right inside of us. But there's more. God also protects us. Just like King Ahaz, just like Matthew, just like the rest of the disciples, I expect Emmanuel, Jesus, this Christmas to protect me and my prayers filled with asking God for protection. I ask him to protect me from the pandemic, from accidents, from cancer, from murder, from death, all of those things. But what happens when the cancer comes and the accident comes and takes that child and the pandemic hits too close to home? What happens then? Is God just gone away? Is Emmanuel just gone away? No. Emmanuel means that God defeated death so that we know that one day we will see our loved ones again. We will be with them. We know that Emmanuel, God with us, means that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing. Jesus, Emmanuel, protects me from that thought and protects me from any discussion. Not even suicide, not even suicide can separate us from the love of God. Hear that. Somebody needs to hear that today. Don't listen to anybody else. Listen to God, Emmanuel, with you. He's not just in your hearts. He's protecting you from all that garbage that Satan wants to throw at you. He came here in the flesh to defeat sin and death, and yes, all of that, but he also comes and he protects us. I'll give you a couple of simple examples how God might be protecting us and we don't even know about it. You go to start your car and it's freezing cold out and your car won't start and you think, poop. I've got to get to work in a half an hour. My car is not going to start. What in the world, Lord? I, you know I got to get to this job. You know I got to get there. So you think what? You go inside, get some coffee. Get the thing warmed up, put the battery thing on it. You're going to be late. You call in. You say you're going to be late. You finally get it started and you go, what if God delaying that starting of the car was because you were going to go right by a snowplow whose brakes went out and he was going to go right into the intersection and hit you? Could that be God protecting you? You betcha. You betcha it can be. How about when God says no? God says sometimes yes, no, and not yet. That's what he says in his prayers, right? So what about the no? What if he says, no, you're not getting that job? And you think, but wait a minute, I've been trying. I've tried out for 27 different jobs, and I want this one so bad, and then you don't get it. Maybe it's God's way of protecting you from those coworkers that are going to drag you into a place where you can't handle. Maybe you're a recovering alcoholic, and that job for you is not going to be good because they're going to go to the bar every single night, and they're going to want you to go, and there's going to be a temptation there. Or maybe you lose your job, and maybe it's because that company is going to dissolve in a year or two, and God wants you here so that you have a stable job. Do we ever think about how God is protecting us? God, Emmanuel, came to earth, yes in the flesh at Christmas, but it means more. It means more than him dying on a cross, and that is huge, and saving me from sin and death. It also means that God does something today for me. He protects me today. He protects me in ways I can't even imagine. And you say, well, sometimes things do happen, and bad things do happen. How is God protecting me now? Because he reminds you that no matter what this world throws at you, he has defeated sin and death, and you will be with him one day. 
So Emmanuel this Christmas is more than just a good feeling or a nice hymn or a nice word on a Christmas card. It actually means that God came in the flesh. He knows what it's like to feel pain. He knows what it's like to bury loved ones. He knows what it's like to be depressed. He knows what it's like to feel grief and anger and sorrow and all those things. And that is so important. But he also came to do something, to do what God does. God does miracles every single day, but we're too busy to even notice them. So I pray that this Christmas, Maybe even this morning, you pray to God to show you how Emmanuel, that name, speaks to you today and how God is working today, protecting you, reminding you that you have eternal life, reminding you that he's a God that knows what you've been through and what you will go through, and reminding you that there's ways that he's protecting you that you don't even know about. I pray that Emmanuel, Emmanuel, will mean more than just a word. I pray that you will know Emmanuel to be true today, protecting you and keeping you safe. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for reminding us that you, Lord, remind us that your sheep listen to your voice. You say you know them and they follow you. You give us eternal life. We shall never perish. And you protect us by reminding us that no one can ever snatch us out of your hand. I thank you, Lord, for reminding me that you protect me in ways that I don't even know. That you do something because you are a powerful God. Sometimes we like to keep you in the manger. But you are a powerful God. And you are Emmanuel, God with us, protecting us and doing amazing things if we'll just stop and look and listen. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. So that's the name Emmanuel. And um, yeah. Now we're going to do some prayers. So remember, now's the prayer time. So I want you to go ahead and type out your prayers. And we'll go ahead and look at those and put them on our prayer chain. Make sure you have approval to lift up someone's name in written format. And go ahead and do that. And we're going to say a generic prayer and end with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we do thank you for being with us. We thank you for reminding us that Emmanuel is in our hearts. You live in our hearts. That is the amazing thing that God is with us. And you also know what it's like. You've been human, so you know that when we pray to you, you know what it's like to feel what we're going through. But it also means that you do something. You don't just sit here and go, boy, that must feel bad. Boy, that must be terrible. You actually do something. You either assure us that we'll see our loved ones again, you remind us that nothing can separate us from your love, and you also continually protect us in ways we'll never know. Lord, I pray for those that are ill, that have cancer. I pray for treatments. I pray for miracles. Lord, show us another miracle. The gift of your son is a miracle, but we want to see more. And so we ask, and Lord, we pray for this virus to end. I pray for those that are lonely and, and feel like Christmas is going to be much different. It is, but Christmas is all about Christ. It's all about you. we got to keep that in mind. And Lord, we thank you for being with us and for teaching us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, so it's time now for our offering. So um, if God is moving in your heart to give a year-end offering, we would love to use it for ministry here at Kingsley United Methodist Church. We do a lot to help out our community, and so you can always mail it to P.O. Box 395, Kingsley, Michigan, 49649, or you can go on to our website, kingsleymethodistchurch.com, and you can pay by PayPal. So will you pray with me over our offering? Let us pray. Holy God, may these gifts we bring to you now come from hearts that are full of the forgiveness you offer every day if we will only accept it. As these gifts go out into our community, may each person feel the very presence of the living God in their lives. 
Amen. <clears throat> You can go by heart, and we're just going to go around town, sing some songs, and spread some cheer. So that's tonight at 6 o'clock from 6 to 8. Meet at the church here and dress warm and be ready to move in your cars. It'll be fun. It'll be interesting. We'll see how that works. <laughs> also, remember that um, Tuesday and Wednesday of this week, coming up from 9 to noon, you can pick up a Christmas Eve worship bag filled with all kinds of goodies and candles to join us on Christmas Eve at 6 o'clock for our online worship service. So I hope you join us at 6 o'clock. And if not, you can take this wonderful little bag and you can do your own Christmas Eve service at home. So I, I hope you do that. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for reminding us that you are our Emmanuel. You are here in our hearts. You've saved us from sin and death, but you also protect us. You're doing something. You never stop. So thank you for reminding us that Emmanuel also means that you are protecting us each and every day in ways we can never understand. May we spread that good news about Emmanuel, God with us, each and every day. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. 